All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, let's study another sutra, shall we? Um, <laughs> uh, tonight, we're still in the, the middle-length discourses, and we're jumping over to sutta number 70. This is the Kitagri Sutra, or Kitagri Sutta, the, the teaching given at Kitagri. So this is the a location. Um, <clears throat> so you may know if you've been coming to Dharma Doors that we're kind of like, we're kind of right in the middle <laughs> of the middle length discourses. And we've been exploring for a few weeks, we've been exploring uh, a group of 10 suttas. And, you know, ostensibly, they're all teachings given to monastics. Like that's the, the grouping. But we haven't actually been kind of focusing so much on the monastic aspect of it. We've sort of been so sort of using these to explore different aspects of the Dharma, different aspects of sutras in general. And I kind of, I put it that way because if, if you were to kind of go just like look up this particular sutta tonight, so our Kitagri Sutra, if you read a summary like on a website like Sutta Central, which is a, you know, a website I use a lot, they kind of summarize this sutra as uh, the Buddha presents a discourse on the health benefits of eating uh, once a day. <laughs> Even though he actually doesn't talk about the health benefits of eating once a day, it actually doesn't have anything to do with that. It It's actually more about the Buddha giving a rule and then a bunch of people kind of dismissing the rule. The rule happens to be about eating once a day, but it's actually kind of rather just circumstantial in that way. So I guess what I'm kind of getting at is, is that if you were looking for like a good sutta to read and you read that this one was about the health benefits of eating once a day, you might skip over this one. <laughs> but that would be unfortunate because there is a lot of really great information in here. Um, yeah, and so this is going to give us a lot to talk about. And as you're going to notice right away, we're not going to be talking about uh, dietary restrictions and eating once a day. So, um, but with that kind of warning or just sort of like preface, uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So let's kind of set up the scene as we usually do, and then we'll kind of talk about what's going on. So. Uh, right away, again, sutta number 70 here, the Kitagri Sutra. And thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering in the Kasi country together with a large Sangha bhikkhus or monastics. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus. I abstain from eating at night. By so doing, I am free from illness and affliction, and I enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Come, bhikkhus, abstain from eating at night. By so doing, you too will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Yes, venerable sir, <clears throat> the bhikkhus replied. <laughs> But then, as the Blessed One was wandering by stages in the Kasi country, he eventually arrived at a Kasi town called Kitagri. And there he lived in this Kasi town, Kitagri. Now, on that occasion, the bhikkhus led by Asaji and Punab Basuka they too were residing in Katagri. Then a number of bhikkhus went and told those two bhikkhus. Friends, the Blessed One and the Sangha of bhikkhus now abstain from eating at night. 
By so doing, they are free from illness and affliction, and they enjoy health, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Come, friends, abstain from eating at night. <laughs> By so doing, you too will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enjoy lightness and strength and a comfortable abiding. But when this was said, the bhikkhus led by Asaji and Punabasuka told the bhikkhus, Friends, we eat in the evening. We eat in the morning. We eat in the day outside of the proper time. And by so doing, we are free from illness and affliction. And we enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Why should we abandon a benefit visible here and now to pursue a benefit to be achieved at a future time? We shall eat in the evening, we shall eat in the morning, and we shall eat in the daytime outside of the proper time. Since the bhikkhus were unable to convince the bhikkhus led by Asaji and Punabasuka, the bhikkhus went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him all that had occurred, adding at the end, And so, Venerable Sir, since we were unable to convince the bhikkhus led by Asaji and Punabasuka, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain bhikkhu, whoever it might be, and saying, Come, bhikkhu, tell the bhikkhus led by Asaji and Punabasuka in my name that the teacher calls them. Yes, Venerable Sir. He replied, and he went to the bhikkhus led by Asaji and Punabasuka and told them, The teacher calls you, friends. <laughs> Yes, friend, they replied, and they went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side. The Blessed One then said, Bhikkhus, is it true that when a number of bhikkhus went and told you, Hey, friends, the Blessed One and the Sangha now abstain from eating at night. Come, friends, abstain from eating at night. And you told the bhikkhus, Friends, we eat in the evening, we eat in the morning, we eat in the daytime outside the proper time. Why should we abandon a benefit visible here and now to pursue a benefit to be achieved at a future time? We shall eat in the evening, in the morning and in the daytime outside the proper time. So is that what you guys said? And they replied, yes, venerable sir. And then the Buddha is going to have something to say to them, but really quickly. So... We encountered this in a couple of suttas ago, and this was the idea that originally, apparently, like in the early days of the Sangha, there was no rule about eating. You, I mean, there was the rule about begging, but daytime, nighttime, beg whenever you want. But then we learned that eventually the Buddha said, hey, everybody, don't eat lunch meaning you can go around in the late morning before noon and you can get leftovers from breakfast and you can eat in the evening, but don't eat like at peak daytime. And then that seems to have gone on for a while, but then the Buddha changed the rules again. And he said, you know what, everybody, we're going to eliminate the evening meal and we're only going to eat once a day leftover breakfast leftovers <laughs> and that's where we're kind of at here is with the buddha getting rid of the evening meal and then of course what's going on here is this group and by the way asaji and punabasuka these two guys they have a reputation for being troublemakers <laughs> so you know it's a kind of an interesting thing if you think about it like from um I guess you could call it like an organizational point of view. But what I mean is, is like, if you really think about it, you know, the Buddha was organizing in a way, a bunch of like, you know, for lack of a better term, like unhoused people, a bunch of different kinds of people from 
kind of all walks of life. And so you have all of these kind of different groups and yeah, they're all kind of Buddhist, but you know, they're all kind of off doing their own thing. And so what do you do when one group is over here and they're like, you know what? We're not going to do that. <laughs> We're not going to follow those, those rules as the same as you. So this sutra is sort of about that. It's about these group that don't want to go with the program in that way. And, and again, the whole eating is not actually what this sutta is about in that way. Now, there's one piece of like key language that I want to draw our attention to. And it's this very interesting language that I think it's a sadji. <clears throat> So the Asaji and Punabasuka, when when they get told, hey, stop eating it at, 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 in the nighttime, and they say, but we eat at the nighttime. And they say, why should we abandon a benefit visible here and now to pursue a benefit to achieve in the future? Now, if you've read sutras, of course, you know, this is like Buddha language. The Buddha talks about how the Dharma, the, the, the results of the Dharma are visible here and now. And what the Buddha is sort of talking against, well, it's a number of things actually, but primarily he's, he's kind of speaking to, you know, yoga, meditation traditions, call them even religious spiritual traditions, that are promising you a reward for your behavior in the next life. So it's like, yeah, it's going to be hard and difficult now, and you're going to have to give up a lot, but ooh, in that next life, it'll be pleasant. It'll all be worth it. And what I think is really interesting about this is that, yes, and I'm sure you can think of other religious traditions that sort of suggest a sort of like uh, a, a struggle now with the promise of a reward later. <laughs> like this is kind of a general operating procedure for a lot of religious traditions. But I also want to draw your attention just quickly as an aside to basically the the like the capitalist fantasy, which says, yeah, work really hard, maybe 40, 50, 60 hours a week, but at the end, it you'll it'll be worth it. And so you're grinding away your job thinking like, but this will all be worth it later on. So I just wanted to take this like outside of the realm of religion and spirituality and just put it in the realm of any kind of view where it's difficult now, but the payoff will make it worth it later. The Buddha has always said that what he's teaching, the, the results of it are realizable right here and right now. And that's a big kind of difference between kind of Buddhist philosophy and, and other philosophies in that way. So the, we're going to get to a better description by the Buddha himself about how it is that the results are right here and right now. But I just want us to notice that Asaji and Punabasuka, they're kind of throwing this idea back in the Buddha's face and saying, no. We eat dinner, we like it, we feel good, therefore the results are present. Don't give us something about if we give up dinner now, it'll lead to some thing in the future. Yeah, so Asachi and Punabasuka are like, yeah, don't give us that. We're good Buddhists. <laughs> or are they? is is the question so that's kind of what's at stake here is this kind of question about the immediacy of results and this kind of overarching idea of like 
is it necessary to listen to the Buddha? <laughs> so let's kind of deep dive into this. I got to tell you, I was, I was almost not going to do this sutra because this section, because the language is so kind of tricky. But I actually realized that if, if we work through this together, it'll really benefit us for future suture studies. We, we, this is information we need to know. <laughs> so let me read it and then we'll try to dissect it. So after confirming with Asaji and Punabasuka, like, is, did you guys say what I think you said about the whole, you know, it's okay to eat dinner? And they say, yeah, that's our position here. So the first thing the Buddha says is this. He says to them, Bhikkhus, have you known me to teach the Dharma in such a way as this, that whatever this person experiences, whether it's pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant, unwholesome states diminish and wholesome states increase? No, venerable sir. There's a big piece of information that's left out of that paragraph. And, you know, I know that uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, they're just translating it, you know, they're just translating what's there. But the little kind of piece of information you need to understand that is when the Buddha says, have you known me to teach the Dharma in such a way as this, that whatever this person experiences, and the Buddha's referring to householders who eat dinner and eat meals whenever they want. That's what he's referring to. And so basically what he's saying is, have you guys ever heard me say that a householder just eating food whenever they want, that when they're experiencing that pleasant feeling that their unwholesome states will diminish because of that? And their wholesome states will increase because of that? Have you ever heard me say that? And they say no. And this little paragraph that's tricky, it'll make even more sense in a moment. So <clears throat> now what the Buddha says is, bhikkhus, haven't you known me to teach the Dharma like this? And this is the way the Buddha teaches the Dharma. Here, when someone feels a certain kind of pleasant feeling, unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish. But when someone else feels another kind of pleasant feeling, unwholesome states diminish and wholesome states increase. Even before I read the rest, let's just work with that so that we know all the, the variables. So this, the, the kind of the, the tacitly understood part of this, the Buddha I mean, you could interpret this as the, and I already sort of did, but you could interpret this as that it's about householders versus renunciants. That's like the normal way that you would interpret this. And so what the Buddha is talking about is he's talking about a householder has certain ideas of pleasure. So when that someone feels a certain kind of pleasurable feeling, you know, sexuality, entertainment, drugs, whatever, whatever, but like those kinds of feelings of pleasure, unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish. But when somebody else, a renunciant, a monastic, feels another kind of pleasure, the pleasure of meditation, the pleasure of independent sovereignty, when they feel that kind of pleasure, unwholesome states diminish and wholesome states increase. 
So this is the way the Buddha is teaching the Dharma. He says, this is the way I teach the Dharma. So, but I want to go a little further than just the kind of like a generic like householder versus renunciant thing. Actually, especially for this group, for us, that's not as interesting. And so what I want you to kind of be, or what I would suggest uh, thinking about this as is rather than thinking about it as householder renunciant, I would like to suggest that we think about it more in terms of conditional dharmas and unconditional dharma. And what I mean by that is, is this. So let me just reread this in kind of um, uh, Michaelese, right? A little bit of my own language in that way. So the Buddha says, bhikkhus, this is how I teach the Dharma. Here, someone feels a certain kind of dependent, pleasant feeling. So a feeling of pleasure dependent upon something. And in case li cases like that, unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish. But when someone feels another kind of independent pleasure, not conditional, not relative to anything, but unconditional, then unwholesome states diminish and wholesome states increase. So now we've dealt with the idea of the two kinds of pleasure Again, it could be householder pleasure, renunciant pleasure, or I like it as dependent, independent. Now we need to talk about unwholesome dharmas and wholesome dharmas, or akushala dharma and kushala dharma. That's what's being translated as wholesome and unwholesome states. I find that language actually kind of confusing in a certain way, but it's Buddhist language. And that's why I wanted to kind of focus on it tonight. So, you know, unwholesome and wholesome are large categories, but I just want to remind you that what we're really talking about with, with Buddhism, unwholesome dharmas are greed, anger, delusion. So that's it. <laughs> but Allow me to say more. We're talking about, you know, greed. We're talking about like out of control greed. Things like addiction, where it's an out of control need for pleasure in that way. Or we're talking about being deceptive, or we're talking about stealing, or just talking about unwholesome behavior. Wholesome behavior, we're talking about being kind, being uh, compassionate, being honest, being truthful, kind of the exact opposites in that way of the, of the unwholesome dharmas. So what the Buddha is basically saying is, is that the way that I teach the dharma is, is that pleasure that's dependent upon things leads to an a, a increase in unwholesome dharmas. Now, when I was kind of reading this and I was kind of preparing like some notes, there was one thought in my mind that kept, it kept popping up. So I just wanted to share it with you. And what it was is it was, I kept having this uh, memory of my first, I guess it was sort of more my second year of college. And I was in, in college during my college days, um, I was what they call a straight edge, uh, meaning I, I didn't drink, I didn't take drugs. It was like my whole identity was about being like straight edge. But I had a lot of friends that were not. I was very kind of like, you know, into mixing with all kinds of crowds in that way. And so I hung out with a lot of people and college days, a lot of my friends, a lot of my companions were getting mixed up with the pleasures of drug use. But what I remembered was, is how a lot of them, their, the pleasure of drug use, it led to a lot of them stealing in order to get money or even breaking into dentist's office and getting medications and things 
in order to satisfy the pleasure. And that was something that came to my mind in terms of a certain kind of pleasure leading to an increase in unwholesome states. That's one way to think about it. There's just one example, again, from like something that I saw in terms of a, like a, you know, a cause and effect thing in terms of it going on like that. But then let's contrast that. So a certain type of pleasure an over pleasure in drug use in that way, leading to stealing. Let's contrast that with the pleasure that one receives, that one gets, that one generates from like a nice, like, you know, multi-day, week-long, multi-week-long meditation retreat. I have also witnessed firsthand experience of the pleasure of a meditation retreat. When people leave, they're way more generous. They just start giving stuff away. They're like super generous, the exact opposite of stealing. <laughs> and so from the pleasure of independent sovereignty cultivated during meditation, that kind of pleasure leads to increased wholesome states like being generous, being kind. So this is the way we kind of want to be looking at like, the rest of the sutra tonight. We have these different variables. Pleasure, we're going to move on to pain, and then we're going to move on to actually neither painful nor pleasurable experiences. So we're going to have that part of the matrix. And then we're going to be looking at the arising or sorry, increasing or decreasing of wholesome and unwholesome dharmas. Any questions about all of those variables before we start kind of really moving through the text? Cool. And everybody's okay with my examples. Again, they're just super from my own personal life in that way. Okay. So let's find out. Those are the example of two kinds of pleasure. Dependent pleasure, independent pleasure. The Buddha goes on to say, and again, this is how he teaches the Dharma. Now, here, when someone feels a certain kind of painful feeling, unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish. But when someone else feels a certain kind of painful feeling, unwholesome states diminish and wholesome states increase. So here, we're still talking about the same idea, but now we're talking about sort of two different kinds of pain in that way. My example, the example that I thought of for this is not, you know, it's not that intricate, but what we want to be thinking about is or I suppose the, the contrast would be about, you know, a painful feeling that is dependent. And what I'm thinking about is like, you know, um, somebody damages your property and that's a painful experience in that way. Or somebody steals your property and that's a painful experience. Or even just things like stubbing your toe and the, it's a painful experience or any number of painful experiences. But what we want to think about are painful experiences that then lead to anger, that then might even lead to violence. So there is a painful feeling, but it leads to an increase in unwholesome dharmas like being angry and then maybe even being violent in that way. Versus there is a kind of painful experience for, say, uh, let me keep my, um, I'll keep my uh, initial example going a little bit. 
going and doing a multi-day meditation retreat isn't all uh, you know, rainbows and sunshine in that way, meaning that there can be a degree of physical discomfort or pain. There can be a degree of um, just boredom in that way. But my point is, and even if you went to like a really traditional meditation retreat, you might be sleeping on like a hard bed. But my point is, is that there are painful aspects to, let's just call it renunciation. But the idea is, is that the kind of that type of pain leads to the diminishment of unwholesome states like anger and things like that, and leads to the increase in wholesome states like we've been talking about, kindness, compassion, wisdom, things like that. So that's kind of what's being spoken about in this regard is the sort of the, the pain of renunciation versus the pain that comes in terms of relationship with things. Again, it could be about property. It could be about um, loved ones, relationships, and the pain of all of that. So more dependent, conditional pain versus a sort of pain that comes from trying to be independent in that way. Any questions about the two different types of pain in that regard and the, them leading to wholesome, unwholesome states? And then that third category, this is also how the Buddha teaches the Dharma. Here, when someone feels a certain kind of neither painful nor pleasant feeling, unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish. But when someone else feels another kind of neither painful nor pleasant feeling, unwholesome states diminish and wholesome states increase. And this whole paragraph, by the way, it ends with Asanji and uh, what's his name? Puna basuka it ends with them saying oh yeah we've we've heard you teach the dharma that way <laughs> like that's how you always teach it but really quickly there's other suttas we've even done one that touched upon this and what it is is the particular flavor of a neither painful nor pleasant feeling a rather kind of neutral feeling in that way there's other suttas where there's kind of like uh yeah we read one many weeks ago where there's even a kind of a debate about whether that type of neither pain nor pleasure is a is a feeling at all or is it actually kind of an awakened state like there's an interesting kind of conversation about this but my understanding of how it's functioning here is about how, and I don't want to, again, I don't want to put this just in terms of householder, but allow me just for the moment. It's about how the householder or just the, the kind of that householder lifestyle, it's sort of very, um, what's the word? Uh, like it's kind of a mania big highs, big lows. Things are either got to be great or it's terrible. And so the neither nor for a householder, it's kind of boring. Uh, it's like, that's, that's boring. I should get into some trouble, do something fun. And that leads to unwholesome state. So there's a way that a, a quote householder reacts to neither painful nor pleasant feelings, doesn't like it, and then seeks out more exciting feelings that lead to all kinds of trouble. Whereas there's another type of person that when they experience neither painful nor pleasant feelings, that's the sweet spot. That's neutral. And so wholesome dharmas increase from that and unwholesome dharmas decrease from that. So those are our sort of different types of pleasure and pain, and then the different ways of that, that they encourage or disencourage wholesome dharmas. No.
I have a question about the pain. I wasn't sure how to ask it, but I think I know how to ask it. So, I mean, you you did say that the pain of loss of, uh, you know, some something, or your, you know, your bicycle or whatever. That's a that's a dependent one. And then at the end, you sort of said something about people as well. Um, and while renunciants, you know, don't have romantic relationships, they do have you know, friends and they have parents and, and, you know, siblings maybe. And I'm, I'm wondering about the loss, that kind of loss. And, and I'm thinking about, I think it's a, a I think there was a story we read once where it just that, oh, I, I won't go into it, but just that if, you know, if you, if there is a kind of pain that even though it is worldly and dependent, like you lose someone you love, that it doesn't then, you know, the world isn't, you know, turned upside down or, it, or even that it becomes a moment of, um, or can, you know, sort of transform into a greater capacity for loving or a greater appreciation of what you had or that sort of thing. So I'm just wondering if that's part of the dependent and dependent. This, this could be, we, I, we could be here all the rest of the night. This is such a important idea. And it, it's like, it's so important. I don't want to like just rush past it, but it's kind of, for me personally, the answer is it's wrapped up in a lot of other ideas. What I kind of just want to cut right to it though, in that way. And what it is, is, is that there's a very subtle, it's a very subtle, but very important, like way of relating to people in particular loved ones. And this plays out in terms of loss of, of loved ones. And it also plays out in terms of like uh, relationships. And what it is, is it is the objectification of people turning a person into an object that's my object. And then this in a relationship can lead to ideas of jealousy because they're mine. And that is actually, and I know, no, you don't need to hear anymore, but this is for everybody else. But there is a way in which that type of objectification is incredibly dehumanizing to people. And loss in terms of grieving the loss of a loved one is complicated because if you look carefully, the loss can be about, oh, poor me, I lost my thing. And that's like from a dependent pain point of view we're right back in there and there's another way of celebrating people's actual existence where you don't objectify them and there is still sadness and loss but it's an actual sadness and loss for that person not for me and my thing so that that's a, a fabulous answer thank you michael um uh, oh, we we had a a class a few years ago, maybe two years ago, maybe a year ago, by Rabina Corton called Love or Attachment. But ah, the whole class was about that. That's uh, awesome. That's recommended. Cool. It's on our YouTube. <laughs> if anyone I wants. recommend, even though I haven't taken it, I recommend it just from the title alone. Yeah. Thank you so much. Awesome. awesome. Yay. Maria. Yeah, just a quick question. Is is the Buddha disparaging householders here or saying it's not possible to sort of be, you know, I mean, we're looking at we're looking at you for one, um, mm -hmm. and you're a householder. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, at least that that, that example, um you know, so anyways, I'm I'm just asking, is that what, what I'm hearing? That's really, Maria, why I wanted to interpret this the way I did in terms of dependent pleasure 
independent pleasure because personally even interpreting this as about household or renunciant is sort of reading into the text a little bit i wanted you to know that that is the traditional normal way to interpret and understand this sutra or any sutra like this but when i read it i don't read it as a total disparagement in terms of um um, I don't read it as a total disparagement in terms of like the utter impossibility of householder um, practice. I think I would just want to, at this point, I would want to remind you, and I know that you know this, Maria, but I would want to remind you that that's what the Bodhisattva path is all about, is about the idea that dependent and independent relationships with the world can happen anywhere. And, and that's where you get the idea of a bodhisattva under a roof, but not a householder in, in a way. So, yeah. So in terms of this sutra, it's probably putting, I mean, especially because I, I don't even know if we're going to get there at this pace, which is fine, but Basically, by the end of this, the Buddha is going to say to the the two uh, monks, you guys are acting like householders. Like, that's what he's ultimately saying. Like, so it is a little bit of, of that. But I just like all great sutras, I just think there's a way to interpret them in a variety of ways. So. Cool. All right. So. That leads us to sort of the next section of the sutra. And there's just sort of like one main idea that, and this is going to be the whole of page, you know, 579 here and on to the next page, but I'll read to you sort of the beginning of it. So after the two renegade uh, rebel monks agree and say, yeah, that's, that's how we've heard you teach the Dharma. The Buddha says, good bhikkhus and if it were unknown to me unseen unfound unrealized and uncontacted by wisdom thus so this is the buddha saying had i not realized by wisdom that here when someone feels a certain kind of pleasant feeling unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish would it be fitting for me not knowing that, to say to that person, abandon such a kind of pleasant feeling. And the bhikkhus agree, no, that wouldn't be right. But because it is known by me, seen, found, realized, contacted by wisdom thus, so the Buddha says, because I do know that here, when someone feels a certain kind of pleasant feeling, unwholesome states increase, and wholesome states diminish. That I therefore say, abandon such a kind of pleasant feeling. So I want to work with this real quick because there's really important language going on in, in this section. So the Buddha is saying like, like if I didn't know this, like if I've never experienced any of this and I was just kind of running around telling people what to do, would that be cool? And I know, like, and he's saying, but because I do know what I'm talking about, because I do understand these things, then I tell you, abandon these dependent kinds of pleasant feelings. Now, the kind of specific language I want to focus on is, so when the Buddha says that he does know that there are certain kinds of pleasant feelings that actually increase unwholesome states or unwholesome dharmas he says yeah to those i say abandon such a kind of pleasant feeling now abandon is this language of relinquishment it's actually the language of upeksha by the way i know we often translate upeksha as equanimity but upeksha means relinquishment letting go so that's an important piece of Buddhist language there, the idea of letting that go. And of course, what we're talking about is that 
you know, you might have dependent pleasures in that way. And they might be dependent pleasures that are not serving you, that you recognize are not helping you, but there's still this habitual tendency towards them because you associate them with pleasure. But the Buddha is saying that because they increase unwholesome states, abandon them. So that's one aspect of the language, the abandoning. But then he says, regarding the next kind, he says, if it were unknown, so if it were unknown by me, unseen, unfound, unrealized, uncontacted by wisdom thus, that here, when someone feels another kind of pleasant feeling, unwholesome states diminish and wholesome states increase. So if I didn't know that, would it be fitting for me not knowing that to tell somebody, enter upon and abide in such a kind of pleasant feeling? Like, would that be right? No, venerable sir, right? And then the same thing for, but because it is known by me, seen by me, found, realized, contacted by wisdom, that there are some feelings of another kind of pleasant where unwholesome states diminish and wholesome states increase. And that I therefore say, enter upon and abide in such a kind of pleasant feeling. So I want to spend a moment on this language of enter into or just enter and abide or enter upon and abide. This is Buddhist language that we hear all the time. We hear about entering samadhis. We hear about entering dhyanas. We hear about entering meditative states. We hear about abiding. We hear about abodes. We hear all of this language. And what I kind of wanted, I wanted to use this sutra tonight to really focus on this idea. And what it is, is I want you to notice or even forget about noticing. I want you to kind of feel the difference between dependent pleasure that is derived from things versus this idea of independent pleasure from and we're just going to keep this simple from you know meditative states but by meditative state i mean independent sovereign not needing anything right well what i want us to notice is is that if i'm getting pleasure from something like maybe it's food again, sexuality, whatever it is. But if I'm getting the pleasure from something, we want to kind of understand or notice that kind of like uh, duality, the subject object, the, um, the, that which is pleasurable and the pleased right? This is, these are all parts of the subject object relationship, right? And so what I want us to kind of think about is over here, we're talking about a pleasure that's not dependent upon anything. So there's no subject object exactly because there's no object. There's no object of pleasure. And so what I'm getting around to is, is that when there's no object to the subject, like in the other way, like the language that we, that the Buddhists use to talk about that is this language of entering and abiding in such a independent sovereign state. And if you are in such a sovereign independent state, but then you start to get bored and want a little goodie, you're no longer abiding in that meditative state. <laughs> so it's a very subtle 
thing <laughs> to be in a meditative state like that. And so the Buddhists use special language to refer to that because, again, it's not like there was anything acquired. And so we kind of need different language. And the different language is entering and abiding in the independent in that way. All right. So there's that part of this that I wanted to focus on, the language of abiding. And then just to sort of summarize this, of course, what, what we like about this or what I like about this is the Buddha is saying, like, I wouldn't be saying this if I hadn't had kind of direct experience of it in that way. Like he's not just sort of talking theoretical. He knows these things. And in a way, he's admitting it would be irresponsible to talk about this if he didn't know it in that way. So I'm not going to go all the way through the, this whole section because he does the same thing with the painful feelings. Like, would, would it be cool for me to go run around telling people to give up painful feelings if I didn't know they caused unwholesome states? No, venerable sir. And then they do it with the neither painful nor pleasant feelings as well. So they go through the whole thing again. And the Buddha says, yeah, it wouldn't be cool if I went around saying all that. But because I know... It's cool. And so then that brings us to sort of, I guess, it's kind of basically getting towards the end of the sutta in that way. So after all of that, we get to this section that's about, well, this is actually, we, we visited this sutra a couple of weeks ago because we were talking about different kinds of uh, states of liberation. And we took a peek at this sutra a few weeks ago, but now we're going to look at that whole section. So this is basically, we're about to get into a section where the Buddha is going to talk about <clears throat> uh, those who have more work to do versus those who don't have any more work to do, i.e. the enlightened, the liberated, and the not yet liberated. So he says, bhikkhus, I don't say of all you bhikkhus that they all still have work to do with diligence, nor do I say all bhikkhus that they have no more work to do with diligence. No, I do not say of those bhikkhus who are arhats, with their taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what they had to be done, who've laid down the burden, reached the true goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and are completely liberated through final knowledge, I don't say that they still have work to do with diligence. And why is that? Because they've done their work with diligence, and they are no more capable of being negligent. So that's the arahat. No more work to do. The Buddha goes on to say, I say of such bhikkhus who are in the, the abhi, the abhi stage, the, the higher stage. And this is something we encountered last week with the abhidharma and the abhivinaya. So I say of bhikkhus who are in the higher training, whose minds have not yet reached the goal and who are still aspiring to the supreme security from bondage, that they still have work to do with diligence. And why is that? Because when those venerable ones make use of suitable resting places and associate with good friends and nurture their spiritual faculties, they may, by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge here and now, and they might enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. Seeing this fruit of diligence for these bhikkhus, I say they still have work to do with diligence. So, our hots are done, but anybody who still has training, they might go sit under a tree or associate with good friends, develop spiritual superpowers or spiritual faculties, and they might become our hots. So they still have work to do. 
And then we get into the actual section that we kind of looked at a few weeks ago. He says, bhikkhus, there are seven kinds of pudgalas, seven kinds of personalities to be found existing in the world. And by the way, these are actually specifically seven kinds of enlightened people, not just seven kinds of people. But these are seven types of pudgalas or in, you know, enlightened pudgalas in that way. What seven? They are one liberated both ways, one liberated by wisdom, a body witness, one who has attained the view, one liberated by faith, a Dharma follower, and a faith follower. So those are our seven options for a kind of enlightened being. What kind of a person, you may ask, is one liberated both ways? Well, here, some person contacts with the body and abides in those liberations that are peaceful and without form, immaterial, transcending forms, and their taints are destroyed by seeing with wisdom. This kind of a person is called one liberated both ways. I do not, the Buddha says, I do not say of such a bhikkhu that they still have work to do with diligence. And why is that? Because they've done the work with diligence. They, have, they are no more capable of being negligent. So that's sort of this highest state of liberation, liberated both ways. I know we talked about this a few weeks ago, but I just want to remind you, there's sort of like these two possible paths to enlightenment. One is the shamatha route, the calming route of meditation, jhana, and samadhi. It's about just calming down, calming down, calming down, calming down. And that's the body way, the meditation way. The other path is the path through wisdom, insight, vipassana, knowledge, knowing and understanding. And there could be somebody who has been liberated both those ways and they don't have any more taints, nothing. They're totally done. So the Buddha says of that type of person liberated both ways, there, the work has been done. By the way, I do want to create uh, put a big reminder to everybody that even though the language of this, of course, is in the masculine, women are arhats, like in the earliest tradition. Women are capable of arhatship just as much. So I want to, I'm reading this gender neutral in that way, and I want to make it clear Fully possible in that sense, even though this is an early Buddhist text. So that's our first one, liberated both ways. What kind of a person is one liberated only by wisdom? Well, here some person does not contact with body and abide in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial transcending forms. But this person's taints have been destroyed by them seeing with wisdom. This kind of a person is called one liberated by wisdom. The Buddha says, and I do not say that such a person or such a bhikkhu or bhikkhuni, that they still have work to do with diligence. And why is that? They've done the work with diligence. They are no more capable of being negligent. So one liberated exclusively by wisdom is also done. No more taints, work is done. Next up, though, is the only the body. Oh, and by the way, the language of um, the peaceful immaterial, I want to remind you that that's about getting into the formless jhanas, basically the samadhis, 
And that's sort of in the original Buddhist program, very necessary for eradicating the taints in that way, or at least it's part of the program. So here we have a body witness and what kind of a person or what, yeah, what kind of a person is a body witness? <clears throat> well, here, some person contacts with their body and abides in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms. <clears throat> and some, some of their taints are destroyed by seeing with wisdom. This kind of a person is called a body witness. And I say of such a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni that they still have work to do with diligence. And why is that? Because when that venerable one makes use of a suitable resting place and associates with good friends and nurtures the spiritual faculties, they may, by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge here and now, and they might enter upon and abide in the supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. Seeing this fruit of diligence for such a bhikkhu, so the Buddha is saying, because I can see that there's still a fruit for them to attain, I say that they still have work to do with diligence. All right, everybody doing okay with those first three? Next up, what kind of a person is one who is a, a, a dristipada, I think it's called, one uh, traveling the path of the view or one attained to the view. Well, this kind of a person does not contact with the body and abide in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial transcending forms, but some of their taints are destroyed by seeing with wisdom and they have reviewed and examined with wisdom the teachings proclaimed by the Tathagata. This kind of a person is called one attained to view. I say as such a bhikkhu that they still have work to do with diligence. And why is that? Because that venerable one might have an insight later on, and therefore I say they still have work to do. Seeing this fruit of diligence for such a bhikkhu, I say that they still have work to do with diligence. By the way, that idea of attaining to the view, you know, there's a lot to that, but it's kind of def defined, at least by Bhikkhu Bodhi, as the understanding the Four Noble Truths is kind of understood to be the view in that regard. And so a person who has attained the view understands the Four Noble Truths, but they haven't had the contact with their body of the formless states and they still have remaining taints to go in that sense. All right. And then next up, what kind of a person is a shraddha vimukti, a, a liberated by faith or liberated by shraddha? Well, here, some person does not contact with the body and abide in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial transcending forms. But nonetheless, some of their taints are destroyed by seeing with wisdom, and they their faith is planted, rooted, and established in the Tathagata. This kind of a person is called one liberated by faith. I say of such a bhikkhu that they still have work to do with diligence. And why is that? Because there might be a certain situation where they do have such realizations and seeing that fruit of diligence for such a bhikkhu, I say that they still have work to do with diligence. By the way, I do want to mention that this aspect, the one liberated, so this is liberation, but you know, not full liberation, but it's liberation through shraddha or faith. And I basically want you to know, because I've mentioned this a lot in Dharma doors, but this little one right here, the being liberated by faith, this becomes a whole part of the later kind of Mahayana Buddhist tradition. It's not in this book that much because this is focused on being like a good monastic in that way. But I just want you to know that it's here 
that there is this other path of faith that is spoken about. And it just becomes more articulated in what we call Mahayana Buddhism. So just wanted to mention that. All right. And then I think this is, uh, we have two more. So, and what kind of a person is a Dharma follower? Well, here, some person also does not contact with the body and abide in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms. And none of their taints. <laughs> oh, I missed that comment. I will get back to it in a second. Um, but for this person, none of the taints have been destroyed by seeing with wisdom. But those teachings proclaimed by the Tathagata are accepted by this person after reflecting on them sufficiently with wisdom. Furthermore, a Dharma, fo a Dharma follower person here has the five spiritual faculties. So this person has the faculty of faith, the faculty of energy, the faculty of mindfulness, the faculty of samadhi concentration, and the faculty of pranya wisdom. This kind of a person is called a dharma follower. I say such a bhikkhu still has work to do with diligence, and why is that? Because I still see this fruit of diligence for a bhikkhu, and therefore I say they still have work to do with diligence. A question about Dharma follower. I'm going to check. Hmm. Hmm. No, the question about the devotional path was that. That that was about the 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 faith, the previous one the faith, right? Yeah, 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 and that is about, and that's what they mean by that the is essentially what they're talking about. Yep, and that's the language of sorry, real quick, the having uh, having their faith planted, rooted, and established in the Tathagata. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And so, you know, a shraddha, the sh liberation through faith or liberation through shraddha is, of course, different than this dharma follower. This dharma follower is sort of like, oh, this sounds good to me. Like, I'm in. Like, no suffering, no anxiety. Like, sign me up. And so they're like into the message, but their taints haven't been destroyed. None of that. So... We have been going, if you haven't noticed, we've been going down in that way from the most enlightened state, liberated both ways, to now we're just a Dharma follower in that sense. It's got to start somewhere though. But we have number seven. This is a faith follower. And what kind of a person is a Shraddhapada, a, a faith follower? Well, this kind of person does not contact with the body and abide in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial transcending forms, and this person's taints have not been destroyed by seeing with wisdom, yet they have sufficient faith in and love for the Tathagata. Furthermore, they have these qualities, the faculty of faith, the faculty of energy, the faculty of mindfulness, the faculty of concentration, and the faculty of wisdom. This kind of person is called a faith follower. I say of such a bhikkhu that they still have work to do with diligence. And why is that? Because when that venerable one makes use of a suitable resting place and associates with good friends and nurtures those spiritual faculties, they may, by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge here and now, enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. Seeing this fruit of diligence for such a bhikkhu, I say that they still have work to do with diligence. Now, paragraph 22 is an interesting one, especially if you're familiar with the 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 uh, hotly debated topic of sudden or gradual enlightenment in the Zen Buddhist tradition. Uh, many, many books have been written on the, is enlightenment sudden or gradual? 
like, does it just happen like that? Or is it a slow process? Well, in paragraph 22 here, the Buddha says, bhikkhus, I do not say that final knowledge is achieved all at once. On the contrary, final knowledge is achieved by gradual training, by gradual practice, by gradual progress. That sounds pretty unequivocal to me. <laughs> but again, this is an early text, but so... Final knowledge, of course, is what we're talking about with that totally enlightened state. But now check this out. This is like the grand, beautiful conclusion to the sutra. Because you might have forgotten where this all started. So after the Buddha says that final knowledge is not achieved all at once, he says, and how is final knowledge achieved by gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress? Well, here, one who has faith in a teacher visits him or her. And when they visit them, pays respect to and honors them with respect. They give ear. And one who gives ear hears the Dharma. Having heard the Dharma, they memorize it. They examine the meaning of the teachings that they have memorized. And when they examine the meaning, they gain a reflective acceptance of those teachings. When they have gained a reflective acceptance of those teachings, zeal or vigor or virya springs up in them. And when zeal or vigor has sprung up in them, they apply, that, they apply their will. And having applied their will, they scrutinize. Having scrutinized, they strive, resolutely striving, and they realize with the body the supreme truth, and they see it by penetrating it with wisdom. And then the Buddha turns to our Asaji and Puna, Puna Basuka, and he says, There has not been that faith, bhikkhus. And there has not been that visiting. And there has not been that paying of respect. And there's not been that giving of ear. And there's not been that hearing of the Dharma. And there hasn't been that memorizing of the Dharma. And there hasn't been that examination of its meaning. And there hasn't been that reflective acceptance of the teachings. And there has not been that zeal. And there has not been the application of will. And there has not been that scrutiny. And there has not been that striving. Bhikkhus, you've lost your way. Bhikkhus, you've been practicing the wrong way. Just how far, Bhikkhus, have these misguided men strayed from the doctrine and the discipline? Bhikkhus, there is a four-phrased statement, and when it is recited, a wise person would quickly understand it. I shall recite it to you, bhikkhus. Try to understand it. Venerable sir, who are we that we should understand the Dharma? <laughs> bhikkhus, even with a teacher who is concerned, so even some other teacher, right? Even a teacher who's concerned with material things, an heir of material things, attached to material things, such haggling by his disciples would not be proper. Such haggling as this. If, you, if we get this, we'll do it. <laughs> if we don't get this, though, we're not going to do it. So... What should be said when the teacher, so what should we say when the teacher is the Tathagata who is utterly detached from material things? Bhikkhus, for faithful disciples who are intent on fathoming the teacher's dispensation, it is natural that they conduct themselves this way. The blessed one is the teacher, 
I am a disciple. The blessed one knows. I don't know. For a faithful disciple who is intent on fathoming the teacher's dispensation, the teacher's dispensation is nourishing and refreshing. For a faithful disciple who is intent on fathoming the teacher's dispensation, it is natural that they would conduct themselves this way. Willingly, let only my skin, sinews, and bones remain, and let the flesh and blood dry up on my body, but my energy shall not be relaxed so long as I have not attained what can be attained by manly strength and manly energy and manly persistence. For a faithful disciple who is intent on fathoming the teacher's dispensation, one of two fruits might be expected. Either final knowledge right here and right now, or if there's a trace of clinging left, non-returning. <laughs> this is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the... The end there. So this kind of circles all the way back around to, you know, being about what the sutra started about, right? Which was about the bhikkhus who were like, you know what? We're not going to do that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we signed up to be your disciples, but we're not going to really listen to what you have to teach. <laughs> and the Buddha's kind of saying, well, that it's not going to really work that way then. But there's obviously more to it than just like obeying the teacher in that way, right? Anything come up for any, anybody on this one? Just a couple of things I want to mention, but anything towards the end? Yeah, Maria. I don't know. Uh, I think it's it's just that this aspect of faith um, and how that plays into this um, is very interesting to me. Um, and that seems to be maybe the, maybe the thing that's, that they most uh, significantly lack in their unwillingness to sort of follow, uh, you know, in that faith in the teachings and that faith um, in the Buddha becomes very, very important. Uh, but um, I'm also curious um about how that uh how you would say that appears more in the Mahayana teachings um is it is it you know faith in the truth of reality um that that where it mm -hmm. appears there or interested about that mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting um I feel like, I feel like, you know, we've, we've talked about this and, and I know even you and I, Maria and other places have, have spoken about this, but it's, you know, the complicated language of faith. It's kind of such a loaded term in, in, especially in dealing with like religion in that way. So I personally would want to kind of rewind a little bit and just sort of like approach this a little bit differently or I want to answer your question, like coming from a different angle. And I think the angle I'll take is a personal angle. I think this, yeah, this will probably be best answered from a personal place. Um, in many ways, I actually can, I can, this, I, it was only your question that made me think of this, by the way, Maria. But I realized that, and I've, I've mentioned this in past Dharma doors, but I realized that I was for many, many years, many, many years, I was a Dharma practitioner, a Dharma student, a Buddhist or whatever, but I was actually a lot like a Saji and Punabasuka. And what I mean is I was on board. I was like, wow, you know, this is the most enlightened teachings ever, like studied, you know, philosophy, studied religions and found Buddhism. And I was like, this is it. But then when it came to practicing, of course, I was always like that whole alcohol one though. 
I think the Buddha missed the mark on the alcohol one. I think I know better than the Buddha on that one. So for years, I just sort of like, I was like, uh, you know, whatever. I just excused that aspect of the practice. A lot like basically these guys that were like, you know what? We like, we like eating at night. That was like me being like, I like drinking. So I don't see the problem, Buddha. And it was only after I stopped that I looked back and could clearly see why it's a, a precept. Meaning that when I was doing it, I could come up with all kinds of excuses of why it needn't be a precept. But once I basically was like, you know what? I I signed up to kind of follow the Buddha. <laughs> and that's a big one, it has been from the beginning. And then again, after I stopped and I can like basically could think clearly, I could not only look back at how it was detrimental to my practice and my behavior, but with clear insight, I could see why it's a precept. And it's not a precept because of like psoriasis, meaning it's not exactly a precept because of the health damage. It's like, if 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 your practice, if you have a good practice, but it's on this wobbly uh, precept, the whole practice is is very at risk. And and I realized that. Um, so that's just a personal kind of thing. Yeah, Maria. Yeah, Maria. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, uh, I don't know how many times I have to hear this teaching <laughs> before um, I really seriously look at my neurotic relationship with cannabis. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, so, you know, it's just that is the thing. And I grew medical cannabis for years and years. And that's the thing for me. And it's like, oh, it's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's, I, I'm totally aware. <laughs> and especially the more I practice and, you know, uh, that there's, a, I'm neurotic about it. I'm totally neurotic about it. And so, yeah, I don't know how many times I have to hear that. And it always goes back every time I'm like, oh, let me poke here. Let me poke there back to that same, same mm -hmm. teaching so mm -hmm. i hear it yeah well thank you any other questions or thoughts or insight yeah robin hi hello um the, the when you they when they talked about the dharma follower having the five faculties are faculties something that how are those um are that something that's um, that's developed or is that sort of a, a faculty is kind of a quality that a person has? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we I sort of spoke quickly about this last week and I'm happy to go into a little more detail here. So last week, I believe it was, we did talk a little bit about Indriya. Indriya is the specific word that's being translated as a faculty. And last week, I think it was, I mentioned, or I, I wanted to draw our attention to um, that a faculty is something like the ability to see. Like we have the faculty of sight. And what's important, like what's subtle but important, is to notice that someone can have eyeballs but not have the faculty of sight. Like a, a blind person can have eyeballs, but they can't see. So there's a difference between the organ and the faculty. And that's helpful for understanding that a faculty is like an, an ability. I say that because these five spiritual faculties are abilities. And indeed, Robin, they are cultivated. 
So you take something like faith. Well, the idea is, is that you kind of like, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly like where they think the organ of faith is. I have a feeling it's just the, the being itself, but the ability to have faith or not is an ability and one cultivates it and gets kind of better at it. One gets better at mindfulness. It's a faculty. One gets better at concentration. It's a faculty. One gets better at wisdom. It's a faculty. And then I guess the other one is energy. Uh, this kind of get up and go or this mm -hmm. drive. So these are faculties, but specifically conducive to spiritual cultivation. And are they are they ever considered like Buddha nature? Something that you have, we would say like, these are faculties uh, that you have as part of Buddha nature? I wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. Only because the idea of Buddha nature is much more, and by the way, for everybody out there, Buddha nature is a kind of a Mahayana idea. You don't really find Buddha nature in the early teachings, just let you know. And the reason why that is, is because Buddha nature is actually, it's normally bound up with the teaching of emptiness. And what I mean by that is, is that the emptiness of the Buddha is no different than the emptiness of Robin. <laughs> they are both equally empty, and that's what puts them on a on an equal, like you are Buddha in that. That's the Buddha nature. So it, it comes through that um, realization of the lacking of inherent nature of everything. Different than the spiritual faculties in that way, yeah that the faculty of wisdom allowed you to understand that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, I guess that's going to be it. It's time, unless anybody has any last questions, comments, answers, or ideas. I think that's a great final note to end on. Cool. So we made it through another sutta. Excellent. And we finished the section on the bhikkhus. Excellent. <laughs> All right, everybody. So that's going to do it for tonight's Dharma Doors. I'll be back next Sunday. Uh, yeah, I will be back next Sunday with another sutta. So I hope I can, hope you'll join me.